Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening live webinar on the Celtic Soul. And it's good to have you this evening and we're going to talk about praying with Celtic holy women. And this is part three of our little series of talks from this amazing book by Bridget Mary Meehan and Regina Madonna Oliver. But before we begin, let us just be still for a moment. And let's just relax and unwind. And just sense the peace, the rhythm, the rhythm of nature. Sense the stillness as we just come back to our heart. And this evening, we begin starting to look at some of these amazing Celtic holy women, our sacred guides and companions. <clears throat> in Celtic society, women in early Christian times were protected by the Brehen law and far more than their Roman and Greek sisters. They enjoyed equality with the men in their society. They could be leaders, lawyers, judges, poets, rulers, warriors, teachers, spiritual guides, and even foreign missionaries. They had the right to marry, to divorce, retain possession of property, and rely on protection against sexual abuse. Of course, as in all societies, the law was not always upheld, and stories of rape exist in many of the legends of the female saints a sign of the increeping of a more male-dominant model which, over the centuries, diffused the original system of equality found in Celtic lands. Because of its isolation as an island on the edge of civilization, the Celts of Ireland gave anthropologists of today a kind of time warp view back into a society where the sexes were on an equal footing. A male dominance made its inroads from the European continent seeping into the Celtic lifestyle and thought patterns. Other inequalities also crept in. A woman's right to property usually ceased at her death but males did not have any restriction on bequeathing property. This may account for the shorter lifespan of monasteries established by women and the longer life of those such as Clon McNoise and Glenda Locke, where I visited when I used to go to Ireland a lot. Both beautiful places established by men whose land rights rested in male ownership. There are exceptions, as in the case of Kilkidi, Kilivi, Kildare, and Whitby in the UK, with Ballyvorney, where the foundations of women were long lived and may have been sustained because of the patronage of a local chieftain or of the saint's own family. Other sites, such as Clumbrony, Killing a boy and Bantry have little to mark them after 1500 years. Some sites in Wales are well kept, including those commemorating Melangal, Winifred, and Nom, as a result of the custodianship of the Church of Wales and the Roman Catholic Church. Other wells of Wales, such as the Well of St. Tegla in Clang. 
are in desperate condition. The partnership of equality of women and men can also be seen in the double monastery system. Both Bridget of Kildare and Hilda of Whitby founded monasteries in which women and men lived. Some believe that Ita's foundation in Kilidi was a mixed community. These monastic settlements, referred to as conhospite or double houses including women and men, some of whom had lived a celibate life, while others were married couples with children, but all living as a Christian community having dedicated their lives to Christ. All, whether married or single, celibate or those with children, but all living as a Christian community, have dedicated their lives to Christ. The Christian Celts at the time did not consider celibacy as somehow higher or more dedicated than marriage, as was the case on the European continent. Both consecrated states were understood as holy and seen as complementary. Now we're going to move from here and we're going to look at a Celtic spiritual adventure. Our search for the women saints of Ireland led us on an adventure of discovery to the holy places sacred to their memory. Devotion to many of these saints is regionally based, except for Bridget, who is nationally acclaimed in Ireland. Even in a particular locality, many residents are unaware of the presence of a shrine to these great women saints, and it often takes more than one inquiry to locate the spot down a twisting road or lane in some isolated part of the country. Information about these hidden saints had to be gathered in bits and pieces. However, once we had arrived at a shrine, there was clear evidence of an enduring reverence for the holy place and its saint. Stone walls marked burial mounds and occasionally whole buildings were still identifiable in spite of the passage of time. Pilgrims were still present and praying and caretakers were attempting to save the remains of these shrines. In Ballyvorne, for example, the O'Herley family who were originally clan chieftains oversee the care of St. Gobnut's church. It should be remembered that like many other saints, these Celtic women were canonized by popular acclaim, not by papal decree, showing once more the deeply rooted spirituality in the hearts of the people. Wow. The transcendent spirituality of the Irish is nowhere more evident than the story of the trip to Bridget's Rock. As soon as we had learned of this rock, in a neighbouring pasture we jumped into the car to seek out the little known shrine. Joe called a local farmer on a cell phone to get permission to cross his field to the shrine. You can cross surely, the neighbour said, but be careful to watch out for the ram. At the junction of the two back roads, we arrived at a fenced field and padlocked gate. Here the car pulled up to stop. What do we do now, we asked. We climbed the fence, said Joe. The little band of pilgrims scaled the gate and set out across the pasture, all the while avoiding the ram, thistles and nettles. Cell phones and automobiles appear to, be seamless, appear to seamlessly merge 
with the ancient in Irish life today. Wow. This is amazing. Come with us then on our holy pursuit of Celtic heroines and expect your journey to be full of unexpected discoveries, little miracles and constant surprises. Make with us a series of pilgrim pauses at each shrine where we will be drawn together into a circle of wisdom and strength radiating from each holy woman. May each circle be for us a thin place where we encounter the holy. May the prayers and reflections we draw from each saint's life nurture our spirits and above all, may we allow this journey to transform us. And now we come to one of Ireland's great saints, Saint Bridget of Kildare. And here we have a reflection of God's mercy. The Spirit of our God is upon me because the Most High has anointed me to bring good news to those who are poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to those held captive recovery of sight to those who are blind and release to those in prison to proclaim the year of God's favor. Let me show you the picture of Bridget holding the bishop's staff. Let me see if you can see it. There we go, down a bit. That's St. Bridget of Ireland. Bridget of Kildare. According to tradition, St. Bridget built her monastery in Kildare beside a large oak tree around 480 AD. In Gaelic, Kildare or Kildare can be translated as cell or church of the oak. And the cathedral in Kildare is built on the site of St. Bridget's 5th century foundation. Here are beautiful stained glass windows depicting stories about the legendary abbess. Still in existence are the foundations of the fire building where Bridget's sisters tended Bridget's fire. A perpetual flame kept burning by Bridget and her nuns from the 6th century until the destruction of the monasteries in the 16th century. Fire is a symbol that reflects back to pre-Christian times, but which is also associated with saints like Bridget and with divine power in Christianity. Some scholars believe that Bridget's foundation may have originally been a sanctuary of Druidic priestesses who converted to Christianity. Sister Mary Minahan, a Bridgetine sister, and Sister Phil O'Shea came to live in Kildare in 1992. They opened Solus Breed, a small Celtic spirituality centre in the spirit of Bridget of Kildare. They welcome pilgrims from all over the world who come to Kildare to walk the ancient paths, pray at Bridget's well, and connect with Ireland's legendary saint. The Bridgetine sisters founded in 1807 are a restoration of the ancient order of Bridget. In 1992, they came to Kildare to reconnect with their roots and to reclaim Bridget in a new way for a new millennium. This led to the relighting of the flame of Bridget in 1993. And in both 1999 and 2000, we met with Sister Mary who shared traditional stories about St. Bridget with us and guided us to the sacred wells of Kildare. 
St. Bridget's Wayside Well, St. Bridget's Well and Prayer Stones, and St. Bridget's Cathedral, and of course St. Bridget's Parish Church. On one occasion we gathered with the friends of Bridget around her flame in a prayer for healing. The spirit of St. Bridget lives on in those who work for the full equality of peoples in the church and in society and to work to promote peace and reconciliation with justice and conversation of God's good earth. Note that the spelling of Bridget varies according to context and usage. St. Bridget's Cathedral is owned by the Church of Ireland and was constructed in the 12th century on the site of St. Bridget's Abbey. In the churchyard is a time-worn round tower and a Celtic cross without its top section. And that, that may date as far back as the 10th century. Wow. Inside the cathedral are pictures, sorry, are picturesque stained glass windows depicting scenes from St. Bridget's life. Also worth noting is a Sheila Nightjig a primitive fertility stone figure hidden under the tomb by the door. In order to see it, you have to get down below on the floor. Wow. This is so amazing when you read about this amazing woman. We know that Bridget of Kildare was born in the year 450 Anno Domini, at the time of transition from pagan to Christian Ireland. Legends say that Bridget was baptized and named by the angels, <clears throat> and that she was midwife to the Virgin Mary and Godmother of Jesus. St. Bridget was the daughter of a pagan Irish chieftain and a Christian slave woman. According to the story, Bridget's pagan father, Dubtach, was a prince and her Christian mother, Brochessa, was a slave. Dubchak's first wife may have banished Brochessa to Fogart before Bridget was born. Custom says that Bridget may have been fostered to a pagan family who provided for her education and her support. In her early years, she is likely to have worked on a farm, milked cows and churned butter. Statues often depict Bridget with a cow with her feet. She was seen as the protector of farm animals and guardian of the harvest. When she reached the age of marriage, she rejected the suitors her father had chosen for her, dedicated her life to Christ, and became an abbess. Bridget was the most prominent woman leader of the Celtic Church. Her symbol was perpetual fire, representing wisdom, healing, poetry, metalworking, and the hearths. Although six lives of Bridget were written before the 8th century and 80 during medieval times, it is difficult to separate fact from legend. Some theorize that she may have been a priestess in service to the goddess Brid, patroness of fire and knowledge in the Druidic pantheon. Before her conversion to Christianity, was facilitated by her own mother. Whatever the circumstances, Bridget and seven companions, robed in white, were baptized and formed Ireland's first monastic community of women at Kildare, a name that means Church of the Oak. As Ireland's advocate of women's rights and roles, she was a courageous risk taker, a healer, an abbess of broad reaching powers, founder of a school of metallurgy, successful administrator, 
and an energetic missionary. Where did she get her strength from? The force of her Celtic soul is a rich lodestone of the Celtic feminine, which continues to challenge each new generation. The stories and legends that follow are, in all likelihood, a blend of Christian beliefs and pagan elements, a mixture of the all-encompassing Druidic mother goddess with the dynamic post-pagan woman of compassion, generous hospitality and charity to all. This blending was not condemned by St. Patrick and later missionaries, but was used as a way to interpret Druidic customs in Christian terms. So gradually the saints and feasts of the liturgical year supplanted the festivals of the gods and goddesses on the Druid calendar. Bridges' previous authority as a high priestess may explain why Saint, why Saint Mel, Bishop of Arda, is said to have ordained her a bishop. The Irish life of Bridget describes it in this way. When the hour of consecration had arrived, the veil was raised by angels from the hand of Macaulay, the minister, and was placed on St. Bridget's head. As she bent down during the prayer, she held the ash beam which supported the altar, which was later changed into acacia, which is neither consumed by fire nor grows old during the passage of the centuries. Bishop Mel, St. Patrick's nephew, who presided at the ceremony said, Come, O holy Bridget, that a veil may be placed on your head before the other virgins. Then being filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit, Wow. Bishop Mel read the form of ordaining a bishop over Bridget. While she was being consecrated, a brilliant fiery flame ascended from her head. Macaulay, Bishop of Mel, Bishop Mel's assistant, complained that a bishop's rank was bestowed on a woman. Bishop Mel argued, but I do not have any power in this matter. That dignity has been given by God to Bridget beyond every other woman. Only this virgin in the whole of Ireland will hold the Episcopal ordination. Bishop Mel seems to say that only the Abbess of Kildare could be ordained bishop. Bridget's successors would continue to have high level authority in the Irish Church. Indeed, other Irish bishops customarily sat at the feet of Bridget's successors until the Synod of Kells ended this custom in 1152. This monastic bishop was peculiar to Irish law and indicated the powerful positions in the Irish Church of abbots and abbesses of the great monasteries. St. Bridget was an Anamkara or soul friend. This practice of spiritual companionship is a characteristic associated with Celtic saints. Bridget's own soul friend was the younger nun, Dalubda, who sometimes functioned as her ambassador. When Bridget told her that she expected to be dying soon, Dalubda begged that she might die together. Bridget responded that, that Darlukta would outlive her for one year in order to succeed her as an abbess. Bridget died on February the 1st and Darlukta died exactly one year later. And there we're going to leave it. And now we're just going to focus on this amazing woman, St. Bridget. So come with me now. Come with me now as we go to Kildare, to the well of Bridget, where the fire of God is lit, 
and just visualize a circle of women dressed in white. And they see you, they call you. Come, join us. And as you sit in this sacred circle, in the center is the sacred fire, a fire representing the Spirit of God. There is a silence. You can hear a pin drop. And in that silence, you hear the voice of Bridget speak to you. Come, my beloved, join us. And now you relax. And in that circle of devoted disciples, you are there as one of them. And in the silence and in the presence of the great Bridget, she comes to you and honors the divine within your being. And she fills you. with a beautiful experience of beholding and enfolding, holding and listening to the voice of God. Sense the peace of God. Your feet are barefoot with the other sisters. And though all around you there's a hurricane blowing, but yet in this circle there is light, there is warmth, and your feet are just right. They've connected with the energy of the sacred earth. And with every in-breath that you breathe in, you breathe in the love of this amazing woman, Bridget, who gave her life to God so that the peoples of the Celtic world could be free of oppression. And you sense her spirit now. And you see her before you go to the flame and with her bare hands, she takes a ball of flame and brings it to you and places it over your head, the fire of God. And this fire does not hurt you, but the fire is filling you with the inner peace of God. And that inner peace is touching every part of you. Sense the peace of God now. Sense this peace as you breathe in. And in your out breath, Release any fear, sadness, disquiet, or concerns to Bridget. She is here to help you. She's here to show you another path. The path of abundance. God's abundance. And she asks you to rest now.
and be still in the sacred circle of light with others who are holding this light. And they each turn to you now. And one after the other, they place their right hand on the person's shoulder so that the one next to you places their hand on each of your shoulders. They've created a magnetic circle of love so that nothing negative can pierce it. And you feel the power and the love flowing into you through these sacred hands. And all is well. All is well. And the Spirit of God is upon you, reawakening your heart to the I am presence of God in the presence of one of Ireland's greatest mystics and saints, Bridget of Kildare, the first female bishop ordained, but not its last. And she places her hands over you and she anoints you not just with fire, but she anoints you in the name of God. And she gives you your proper name, soul friend. You are my soul friend. Be still. Relax. and allow her love for you. Really awaken within you the feminine energy of God. Be still. Be still now. Be still. And Bridget shares these words with you now as you sit in the presence of love. O oh God of compassion and healing, you have given Holy Bridget to us as a sign of your love. You, ca you caress us with the warmth of the sun. You encircle us in love's embrace. You are behind us and before us. You are above us and beneath us. I consecrate all that I am to you. Sit still for a moment and quieten your soul. Now breathe in deeply and take the tenderness of God and breathe out compassion for all living things. In the Christian Gospel of Matthew 25, verse 35 to 36 we read I was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink I was a stranger and you welcomed me I was naked and you gave me clothing I was sick and you took care of me I was in prison and you visited me Reflect on those words. And we have intercessions that really do touch. That I may give as gifts the gifts I have received, I pray. Response, may I like Bridget be a reflection of God's compassion in our world today. That I may care for our marvelous planet with its animals and plants, I pray. 
May I, like Bridget, respect and nurture all earth's creatures, that I may share my food, clothing, home, and time generously, I pray. Response, may I, like Bridget, serve those who are in need. And now for Bridget's blessing, which I share with you. May Bridget bless the house wherein you dwell, Bless every fireside, every wall and door. Bless every heart that beats beneath its roof. Bless every hand that toils to bring it joy. Bless every foot that walks its portals through. May Bridget bless the house that shelters you. So just be still now and relax and just know in this circle of love that you are welcome. And now as you open your eyes, you look around you and you know that your shelter where you live has been truly blessed by Bridget. Relax now. And thank you for your time. Thank you for staying with us this evening. And I hope you enjoyed an introduction to one of the great Celtic holy women, Bridget of Kildare. Good night and God bless you. Mm -hmm.